In this panel, political research and video content analysis, these papers take both a longitudinal and single event approach to political phenomenon, including behavior in televised presidential debates, analysis of farm policy, and the visual symbols in the second Trump impeachment trial. From violations of traditional debate space to the visuals included, including vid uh, video exhibits in the once stayed Senate, to the evolution of farm policy, we see change across very different political arenas. This panel is moderated by Allison Novak, Associate Professor at Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey. She received her PhD in communication, culture and media from Drexel University. Her work examines political engagement, discursive construction of policy and digital media. She is the author of three books and has had her work featured in Wired Magazine, NBC News and BBC Radio. Welcome, Alison Novak. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this all week. We have a great panel ahead of us, uh, three papers, um, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the overlaps and the challenges that they raise to each other and a really robust conversation that might come from that. So without further ado, we're going to jump into our first paper, and that is brought to us by uh, Eric Busey and Devon Shaw. Um, and I believe they have a slight change to the name of their paper, but I will read their bios very quickly um, and then we will get started. So Eric Busey is the Marshall and Charlene Formby Regents Professor of Strategic Communication in the College of Media and Communication at Texas Tech University. He teaches and conducts research on disinformation, visual communication, and political nonverbal behavior and public opinion about the press. Busey is the author of Image Bites Politics, News and the Visual Framing of Elections, and the editor of the source book for political communication research. He's a past editor of the Cambridge published journal Politics and Life Sciences, and Busey recently guest edited a special issue of the International Journal of Press and Politics and Visual Politics. He is recently, he is currently assembling a collection of essays for Handbook of Visual Politics, and Busey has held fellowships at the London School of Economics, Oxford University, where he was recently named an honorary fellow of Mass Communication Research, of the Mass Communication Research Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I believe um, his colleague, Devon Shaw, is the Louise A. and Mary E. Mazur Basecom Professor at the University of Wisconsin, where he is the Director of Mass Communication Research Center and the Scientific Director in the Center for Health Enhancement System Studies. Shaw's research focuses on the influence of conventional and digital media on social judgments, civic engagement, and health support. Uh, he has received over $40 million in public funding and, and funding from private foundations, public foundations, and large public entities. And Shaw's primary appointments in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication with joint appointments in industrial systems, engineering, marketing, and political science. So we will welcome both uh, Eric and Devon to present their paper. And I'm going to read the, the new slightly uh, changed title, which is Detecting Nonverbal Aggression in Presidential Debate, a Demonstration Rationale for C-SPAN Data Co-op. Thanks for that, Allison. Um, I should have sent in shorter bios. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Um, and I'm going to pull up a PowerPoint presentation. No, not everybody's been doing that. Can everybody see it though? Yep, okay, we're good. Um, but I like to use it because we cover a lot of ground uh, in these talks and there's a lot of variables and even some demonstration um, at play. And Allison, about how much time do I have? I would say you have about uh, 20 minutes or so so that we have time for a robust conversation. Okay, so be sure to remind me if I'm getting close. So um, it's an interesting thing about the title because this really combines kind of two talks. One is our analysis of uh, nonverbal behavior, particularly uh, aggressive aggression and um, kind of more assertive behaviors over time, looking at uh, a corpus of presidential debates. And another one is a workshop um, Devon and I gave recently uh, to C-SPAN, um, but really kind of uh, looking at more the idea of how to share this type of research. 
and really the creation of a data co-op. And that was part of our proposal for the conference. So it's really two talks in one. I'll get to the data co-op towards the end. Uh, it really comes out of a um, open science kind of framework and um, kind of initiative. And it's really exciting. Um, we've been talking to Robert Browning about it. And the intention is to share some of our data to put up um, our research and make it available so that other people can come along and really perform this kind of analysis and not just the coding of it, but the parsing of it uh, in relation to computational techniques. And we'll share some of our codes there. And then also uh, eventually Twitter data or other social media data that if we can't make available, we'll at least point to exactly what we use so it can be replicated. So anyway, with, um, with that in mind, let me get going here. And um, if you've seen me talk about this uh, before, you'll, you'll know that I focus on, uh, in nonverbal uh, communication, I like to focus on facial displays and gestures primarily. And I think they have uh, incredible significance in politics. In addition to that, I like to look at voice tone. Uh, and then you can pick up on some of this in linguistic cues whether it's language that might deal with uh, anger or uh, more accusatory tone that might deal with blame. Um, but I'm really all about the visual and the nonverbal. Um, and it's really been that way, uh, you know, my entire kind of uh, research trajectory. And I think it's something we overlook and it's just readily evident if you look at politics. Uh, and so you have to ask, what's the effect? So one of the things about facial displays is that they really convey a couple of different things. They convey both the emotion of the communicator, that's the, the feeling expressed. Now, if it's whether it's genuine or not, um, we can't really determine just from looking at it. Uh, but they also communicate motiv motivational intent. So uh, this could be in the case of kind of a happiness or a smile display, it might be reassurance. In other words, the feeling that um, you're not gonna get attacked or that somebody is approaching you in a very, friendly kind of way, uh, not in a threatening way. On the other hand, uh, anger may communicate a kind of threat, and particularly if it's accompanied by other um, facial features like a fixed stare, uh, firm, uh, kind of rigid posture, and um, uh, gestures that kind of you know, reinforce that intent. Uh, fear or evasion might be conveyed by in politics by trying to get out of a question, looking down, um, indicating avoidance in some way. Sadness um, is, is really just uh, what it is on its face. And we see this in politics, uh, particularly at the um, kind of news of uh, disasters or catastrophes or terrorist attacks. Uh, and sadness in a classic sense would indicate appeasement, but not always in politics. So it, that's not always the motivational intent there, but it, but it is one of the classic kind of meanings of it. Um, so it's interesting that reassurance will discourage aggressive or fight responses and others. In other words, a smile will kind of uh, keep people uh, around and will attract uh, others, particularly critics, you know, promote bonding. But here's the other interesting thing is that a threat display will also promote bonding, uh, particularly among followers. So you wonder why some politicians in our politics generally is getting more um, kind of assertive and hostile. Well, it really works for in, in terms of in-group dynamics. So <clears throat> we've got all these tools in our um, communication center at, at Texas Tech. And one of them is a dial test theater. And during the um, debates in 2012 and 2016, we ran these uh, continuous response studies where you can see um, <clears throat> different groups of viewers, uh, whether by gender, whether by party, kind of responding to the different candidates. So here you have Trump aggressing um, and he's, he's starting to um, become kind of non-verbally animated and he's making an accusation and uh, Clinton's kind of, uh, kind of waiting it out, but you start to see the numbers move and his supporters really um, respond to this. So, you know, does aggression work? Yeah, I've seen it work. We've also seen it work in Twitter. In Twitter. Now, this is a, a, a really um, kind of resonant moment where Trump supporters basically, you know, hit the ceiling on their support for what he was doing, what he was saying. You clearly see Clinton's not really agreeing with any of it. Doesn't matter. His supporters are um, all about it. So it's interesting to see this kind of uh, confirmation of some of the uh, behavioral literature that, oh, 
A tax rally? What are you talking about? I don't like the tax. Oh, no. You show it to supporters, and that's what happens. Um, so <clears throat> the other thing that's important to kind of establish when you're, when you're looking at nonverbal behavior, it's not like a gestalt or an interpretive or an intuitive kind of thing. You actually look at specific features of um, faces and of, um, you know, candidate uh, physical movement. So whether it's the, the eyes, including eye orientation, what the brows are doing, and the corners of your mouth, whether they're raised, whether they're lowered, and whether teeth are showing, your head motion, your head orientation. Teeth is really interesting because you think, what does teeth have to do with anything? Well, it has a lot to do with it. If you're happy, if you're smiling, you'll generally see your upper row of teeth if it's a big smile. If you're laughing, for instance, next time someone laughs, look at their teeth. <laughs> what are you seeing? You're seeing mine now, kind of upper. If you're, oops, sorry. If you're um, frowning, if you're angry, well, sorry, this is overly sensitive. If you're angry, you can see Obama here in the right um, corner. Um, you see the lower teeth. And so there really is something to these kind of uh, anatomical displays. And then when it's neutral, you may not see uh, any teeth and you don't see a, a softening of the eyes necessarily that you do with a reassurance display. And with evasion, you, you notice that there's kind of a tilting of a head and a looking down. So they're very reliable um, indicators of what someone is communicating, maybe how they're feeling, but certainly what they're projecting. And it varies slightly from candidate to candidate, but you do see commonalities. And when there's anger, there's lower teeth and there's a fixed stare. And when there's evasion, it's looking down and it's and it's moving your head in a certain direction. And when there's happiness, there's um, there's teeth showing. Now, why is all this important from a coding perspective? Well, number one, you want to get intercoder reliability. But number two, when you move to machine coding and uh, computational techniques, you want to know what to look for. And so thankfully, the behavioral literature is, is pointed out exactly what we should be looking for. So this kind of uh, brings up an age old question, which is, um, you know, how much do these visual factors and candidate appearance characteristics uh, influence audiences? Are they more important than what candidates say? Is that a false dichotomy? Do they really work in conjunction? I think they do. Um, and what are audiences paying attention to? And for that, you really do need the audience component, whether it's a dial test, but that doesn't get you um, incredible detail. Or more recently, we can get Twitter response. Of course, I run um, you know, a variety of methods and we might even use uh, focus groups as well. So here's some summary evidence of um, some of our nonverbal coding. Uh, and this was looking at the 2012 debates and this was coded in 30 second increments. And what we noticed today, was that, uh, in fact, Obama was um, being quite evasive, and in, in other words, looking down in that first debate. And these are um, the number of instances. And compared to Romney, it really stood out. It was at twice the rate, and it really bothered a lot of Democrats. So whereas anger and threat may rally and happy, happy uh, reassurance displays may bond, um, fear of Asian doesn't do any of that. And there was a general freak out on the Democratic side. You also notice that um, Obama's use of affinity gestures, but gestures overall was, was much lower. Um, let me just show you briefly what that looked like. Down to 25%. But, but don't forget, you put $90 billion, like 50 years worth of breaks into, into solar and wind, to, to, to Solyndra. And so he's looking down, he's looking down, he keeps looking down, he's, and he's writing notes and He's showing some frustration there in his lip compression, um, but he's not really engaging with Romney. Um, partisans didn't like that. But, but don't forget. Uh, now we go to debate three. Did Obama learn, did he, did he change his approach? Absolutely. Looking down is barely present. And in fact, Obama did it less, according to our coding, than Romney did. And suddenly defiance and things that are more assertive, such as an angry or threatening face, and even his tone all starts to increase. So very dramatic differences that you can document with some of this nonverbal coding. So very briefly, what does this look like? To help this industry get on its feet. And the idea that has been suggested that I would liquidate the industry, of course not. 
Of course not. Let's check that's the, the height of silliness. Let, let, I have let's never said that. I, I would liquidate the English yeah. governor. I want to keep the industry going and forgetting. So a couple things here. He's not looking down. He's interrupting, which is um, kind of a, a aggressive move. Um, he's speaking over Romney and he's engaging him visually. I, I call this a visual, a form of visual auditing. And um, the responses okay, were, were much improved for Obama. So <clears throat> you see a variability of displays among candidates. Um, and the most effective communicators really do have a rich uh, repertoire. But even if you're kind of monochromatic, uh, like Trump was, you really get um, uh, partisans, at least, to respond to that. And what we're seeing uh, kind of internationally, but also in U.S. politics, is a, is a rise of a more aggressive style um, of communication and what Diana Mutz has called in-your-face politics. But really, it corresponds and dovetails with the rise of populism uh, around the globe. And, and populists um, have both kind of a core set of uh, issues and propositions, but really a style of communicating that makes them distinctive more than uh, an ideology. And there's been a lot of work on this, particularly in um, the communication of, of populism over in Europe. And if you distill it, and this is mostly just the, uh, the verbal aspects of it, the rhetorical aspects of it. And if you distill it down, um, one group identified three primary characteristics, simplification, emotionalization, uh, and negativity. So that led me to think, well, can we track this over time? If there's this now in your face style in US politics, when did it start and what did it look like in previous eras? So thankfully archives like the C-SPAN archive have the debates going all the way back. Um, and we start with our analysis in 1976 because it's the onset of color television. Um, the 1960 debates, initiated um, you know, televised presidential debates in US politics, but there was a big break. So we wanted kind of a continuous data set. So we start with 1976 and go all the way up to uh, 2020. The basic question is, have we witnessed an increase in, in political aggression over time? Um, so anyway, I don't wanna, wanna dwell on the, on the populist literature, but it's out there. And what we did was we mapped onto that with an analysis of the 2016 debate uh, that kind of led to the current work that we're doing. Uh, and so we looked at Trump's style as kind of a transgressive style. It's really the performance of populism. Uh, and it really does kind of um, both resonate, as I showed, but it also stands out in relation to previous uh, styles of communication in U.S. politics. Some of the variables we use, um, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to follow up with uh, articles or uh, any kind of questions and, you know, do my best to answer, but, um, and share the research. Basically, we're looking at um, facial displays, we're looking at uh, gestures, even things like nonverbal disagreement, someone's shaking their head, they're wagging their finger. <laughs> Clinton had a signature wave off, as you can see kind of here, you know, Trump was trying to wave her off, there's a dual wave off there. Hostile interruptions, these can, these can be both verbal, they can also be visual if somebody does something in a split screen format to draw attention uh, away from the speaking candidate that could be considered uh, an interruption and inappropriate displays. But wait, there's more, there's character attacks, there's tone, there's even um, language that we've uh, coded in terms of its anger content using the loop program, blame language using uh, diction that Rod Hart um, Kind of introduced. And so there's a lot to look at, mostly nonverbal, but some of it verbal, and all of it seems to matter. Here you can see the 2016 debates, um, Trump's communication and performance just um, far more demonstrative uh, than um, Clinton's was. And that was obvious. We all knew it just from watching it, but it's interesting to have data on it. By the third debate, Clinton is more expressive, but Trump continues to um, kind of outperform um, her. And uh, then we, we normed it to the 2012 debate, thinking, well, maybe gender had something to do with it. So if we look at Trump versus Obama and Romney, how does that um, compare? In fact, Trump outperforms Obama and Romney in both debate one and debate three. Um, so there's definitely something uh, distinct going on there. Now, longitudinally, it's really interesting to think about 
uh, you know, the previous era of politics, oops, sorry, <clears throat> that <clears throat> the, um, the televised debates really capture well and how polite and civil it was. It not, it's not that there weren't any barbs thrown or criticisms leveled, there was, uh, as well as one-liners. You can see Mondale um, here in the left really laughing at, at one that um, Reagan had. But <clears throat> what we notice as we get to the more modern era is a more kind of confrontational style and a more interruptive style <clears throat> and a less kind of classical, um, I'll let you have the floor and, and hear your argument uh, style. So when did this start and can we track it by looking at certain behaviors over time? So here we just look at affinity gestures, which are kind of open palm displays, things that are inviting, things that are friendly, um, things that are kind of introduced waves or that are soft, that are different from, def different from defiance, which is very um, kind of rigid and accusatory. So affinity was present in uh, most of the debates we looked at, and this is only a 20% sample so that we can um, you know, get through all the different years and at least have a chunk of data for each um, uh, debate year. And so um, candidate one is usually the incumbent, candidate two is usually the challenger, 92, Ross Perot is the third candidate. But you see that it, it's, it's actually present. Now, these are instances, so it's not that present. When we looked at defiance and suddenly the index goes right, way up. So even here, it's um, at a higher level than affinity was. And you notice that it spikes in different years, 1988, uh, and then, of course, in 2020, where um, we need to insert 2016, but it's also high. And so there's an interesting kind of a trend. If we drew a trend line there, it's certainly going up over time. It's not exactly a perfect linear trend, but you definitely see something going on there. And particularly if we put in 2016, we looked at uh, affiliative behaviors by year. So this would be um, not only affinity gestures, but happiness reassurance displays and what's called communal kind of uh, activity or posture, which is kind of inviting more relational communication as opposed to agentic, which is more self-centered and more um, action oriented. Anyway, affiliative, uh, affiliative behaviors are, are present, although they, um, they dip by year. And then we looked at nonverbal aggression. And here you see a kind of plateauing of it for a long period of time, and then a sudden and huge increase, of course, in 2020, compared to the rest of uh, the debate uh, era. And this is what we suspected. Again, it's really interesting to have data on it. And then uh, the same thing goes for verbal um, kind of anger in the, in the tone, uh, as opposed to the, just the content. And, and this is at a much higher level um, than previous eras. So then the question is, what do you do with this? <clears throat> well, in previous research, a lot of the uh, coding just kind of stopped at the level of description. This is what the candidates were doing. And, um, and you know, it's interesting, right? Uh, it probably had an effect on observers. Well, you know, rarely was there even a focus group conducted to, to try to determine the resonance of the behavior. What we've done, um, you know, both with my coding and then Devon's team at uh, Madison is to look at what's the effect, particularly in 2012 and 2016, but also working on 2020, of the first screen, in other words, the behavior that the candidates are performing on the first screen, on the second screen of um, your tablet or your phone. So, in other words, a social media response. And what do audiences respond to? And what does this confirm about our notions about um, what communication influence actually is? So uh, there's a lot of detail to this. I don't have any time to get into that. There's lags, there's synchronizing, for, we're using Twitter, there's um, making sure everything lines up, and there's isolating the variance, which uh, results in very complicated statistical models. There's a lot more uh, Twitter and, and other kinds of data available now through different platforms, which is a good thing for research. And there's a lot of details that go into this. Again, I don't have time uh, to get into it, but the, the nice thing is that the outcome measures are literally in the millions. So, you know, think about the small scale um, demonstration I showed with the dial test. That was 34 people. And then Trump supporters were only about half of that. 
And so um, now we're talking about very large scale social level data. Um, it's really the effect of nonverbal and, and even um, some um, rhetorical content on a mass scale. So here we're just looking at the volume of mentions that mention um, in the first debate of 2016 that mentioned either Trump or Clinton. And you can see that Trump's mentions are uh, at times more than twice as high as Clinton's mentions. Now, why is that? This is where the modeling comes in. So we created all these indexes. One was a visual, and this is a, what we call the visual populism index. This is a tonal index. Uh, and then the, this was verbal or rhetorical moves, anger language, blame um, language, and put down to character attacks. And what we notice is that the visual population uh, populism index, regardless of the time lag, at 10 seconds, 20, 30, 40, all the way out to a minute, whatever Trump is doing, these are Trump's um, um, Twitter mentions, whatever Trump's doing visually, it's resonating with the audience at every time lag at a significant level. Even was well, tone even takes a while, 40 seconds out for some reason. And then the verbal stuff goes in a negative direction, but maybe positive at, at 40 seconds out. And if you look at Clinton's, it's a much different picture. Her nonverbals are there, but sporadic and not as strongly resonant. Uh, her voice tone isn't really being picked up, at least in Twitter, but her verbals are, but only at a half a minute in. Now, if you're um, more interested in publicity and attention than you are in uh, making winning the argument, then you adopt a Trump style. You get resonance at every leg we measured. If you're more interested in winning the argument, you adopt a Clinton style. Um, and you, you win the day, but you get a response um, that lags. <clears throat> now I'm probably getting close to um, my time here. So I just wanna say that from a lot of this research we've been doing, we, we find that um, visuals really do seem to drive the effect, but it's in conjunction with other factors, uh, both tonal factors and um, some rhetorical factors that we're considering. So the next move is towards computation. And um, we can take these same sets of behaviors and now train a machine classifier. This is also very detailed, also takes a lot of time. Uh, it be a very long um, uh, presentation. In fact, you can look at our workshop a couple of weeks ago, um, which will be up on the, the C-SPAN um, workshop website pretty soon. And what we uh, discussed there is that um, using our 20% coding, that a machine classifier was uh, run at, at Madison was, was very uh, effective at uh, classifying uh, aggression in the last two debate seasons. It was not as effective as, as classifying aggression um, uh, in, in the prior uh, era. So, you know, here it's almost 90 or above 90 percent. Here it's not even 60 percent. However, it was effective in classifying more uh, affiliative, more positive, reassuring behaviors prior to 2016. So this kind of indicates um, or and verifies, that in fact, there were two different eras of politics. So it's it's a way of triangulating data. But the reason we're really interested in computation is that if we can train a classifier, and if we can eventually develop an algorithm for detecting either um, candidate motion or candidate behavior, and eventually um, finer grain aspects of that, we can conduct this analysis in an almost real-time way so that everybody can start to use it. And we can know the results uh, you know, days after an event, or maybe even that night, rather than years after an event, after a human hand codes it. So there's all kinds of details that um, off the shelf systems and, and custom systems will look at, including facial muscles, but also things like teeth and uh, lip corners and, and all the things that we're uh, already coding for manually. Um, there's aspects of voice we wanna look at in terms of um, the tonal qualities and uh, pitch and, and sound. <clears throat> and then we wanna combine it with um, ultimately what was said, along with the way it was said and the way it was performed. 
So <clears throat> this leads us to kind of an open science suggestion. Uh, and it's a really exciting notion, which is to make this coding available on the C-SPAN website through a data co-op in the spirit of open science, which is to um, accelerate the whole research project by putting our uh, kind of data and our techniques available and ultimately um, some of our computer coding up there <clears throat> so that other people can build on it and refine it and move at a much, much faster clip. So not only do we get faster turnarounds on political events, and this could be not just debates, but protests, it could be speeches, it could be um, any kind of encounter or interview. If you wonder what's going on, if we have these tools and um, protocols and definitions in place, we can analyze it. So the goal of the, uh, the C-SPAN data co-op is to provide the raw data, which would also include videos, that's where it all starts, which is kind of an image layer, so that uh, an analysis of the images and, and moving video can take place, along with the audio that's embedded in that, along with uh, the text eventually that's also uh, there from debate transcripts. And to combine this with our manual coding, which is what uh, we find from this so that we have a training set for computational analysis and then to provide what some of the techniques are uh, and even if possible some of the social media data so that you have a one-stop shop for performing the next generation in kind of a digital platform of uh, debate analysis that can eventually lead to a lot more insights than we're able to do uh, on a um, on a human level. So um, anyway, <clears throat> I know I'm out of time now, but <laughs> let me um, just say I'm happy to share the presentation. You can go back and look at it, um, but we've, we've got a plan and we're in the very early stages of implementing it and it's a really exciting time. So thank you very much. All right, thank you for sharing, Eric. That was uh, wonderful and sounds like a really great step forward for the archives to have some real-time analysis. Um, we do have time for a couple questions and I'll start us off um, with a question about um, one of the things you brought up at the end of your paper, which had to do with comparing those um, primary um, debate gestures that you were sort of visually visualizing there. Um, and my question to you is the primary debate style that many candidates adopt is, is very different than what they do when they are sort of the main characters on the stage. They're no longer fighting for the same amount of attention or the, um, the ability to answer questions. And so I'm, quite, I'm wondering how uh, sort of styles evolve within a very short period of time. And if maybe that is also indicative of those changes that we see from debates one to four, considering the first debate would be the first one out of the primaries, which would have a very different style. And they sort of mature in that, that four debate span that they may have or less than that in some cases. Right, yeah, the first debate in general election is always more consequential and always more, a, a little more aggressive, although, the candidate who feels behind when they come back, particularly by the third debate, um, does tend to be um, more assertive, but by then it's, it's usually too late. But absolutely, the, the intra-party contests um, during primaries are probably a lot more aggressive than this. And so when we think about, okay, what's the origin or the testing and proving ground of aggression in debate and politics, it, it probably is the primary space. Uh, and so that's important to look at the, the, you know, the decision you have to make is, do you analyze uh, a field of candidates who aren't even going to be seen by the wider public, but you're going to understand aggression better? Or do you look at the candidates who actually make it in front of the American public overall? Um, and so we decided to start with general election. And if aggression is there, it's certainly there in the primaries. Great, thank you. We do have time if anyone would like to bring up a question now for Eric, although we'll try to have some time at the end for all three uh, projects. Actually, Allison, I do have a question. Sure. Um, so you were talking about the, um, Eric, you were talking about the, the variance in, you know, between the, the, the two candidates. What are you finding when it comes to the candidates within each political party during a debate? Right. Um, 
That's a good question. We haven't looked at that specifically. Uh, I would say that there are particular elections where you notice the differences. And I think 2008 was one uh, with McCain and Palin uh, on the Republican side um, and uh, Obama and Biden on the Democratic side. There was much more of an aggressive, assertive kind of in your face style on McCain side. Um, 2012 was fairly evenly matched. Uh, Romney was a little more assertive and he was able to score some points, and particularly in that first debate. Um, but it wasn't necessarily kind of partisan, uh, at least his style, not that much. Um, whereas in 2008, it seemed to be more of a Tea Party kind of influence, which was affecting, uh, uh, affecting the Republican side. And then you get that fully expressed in Trump in 2016 and 2020. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how uh, and in what ways that continues um, these days, because, you know, there's policy positions, but increasingly there's these stylistic considerations that are just so obvious you can't ignore them anymore. I see Robert, you have your hand up as well. Uh, yeah, uh, Eric, what do you do about the so much of your work there is micro level, the, although you had the hand movement. What do you do when the candidates leave their space? Ah, uh, when they don't uh, play by the rules? Yeah, I mean, we saw, you know, we saw uh, the moving around of uh, Trump getting in Clinton's space, so to speak. Do you, do you, do you look at that at all? Yeah, I actually do. I, I, I use different technique, though. I use focus groups for that. Um, and oh. so what I do is I um, kind of identify the clips of interest and I call them memorable moments in televised politics. And I'll show them to groups and I'll show one style. For instance, I, I did show a um, series of focus groups. And I usually do this through my classes. So it's really my students doing it. But that way you get 10 focus groups instead of just the couple that I could do. Um, so it's a quick way to generate a lot of uh, transcripts. And people are, are really um, articulate and perceptive in these groups. So, you know, I value um, all kinds of different methodologies and depending on the question. The other thing um, that comes up when you look at the town hall style debates so there's a lot of movement and a lot of things that would be difficult to track because someone might be in the process of walking somewhere. Someone might be turning. Uh, it's not a kind of um, level or, or equal kind of unchanging, um, you know, communicative stance. And so in that sense, I think you do have to do it a little more piecemeal, a little more interpretive, and then let the audience tell you what they're noticing. And they noticed Trump standing behind Clinton very prominently. And they, they said, you know, I, I didn't think about it when I was watching the debate, but I didn't hear a word she said. I was looking at him the whole time. Mm -hmm. This is in focus group. So I find that very valuable even after the fact, even among people who might have seen the debate the first time. It, it's all a blur when you go by. When they say, we're going to watch a clip. And then sometimes what you can do is you can show the same clip a second time with the sound off. And then you really get to focus on the nonverbal. Well, thank you, Eric. Um, we appreciate your work here and I'm sure we'll have uh, more time for questions after our other papers. Um, so with that, we will welcome Jacob Miller, who is a PhD student at Kansas State University and who has received an NSF funded um, NRT R3 research trainee grant that um, allows him to study um, the relationship between social systems and sustainable agriculture and climate change effects, obviously a very timely topic. He's been published in the rhetoric of fascism as well as the Northwest Journal of Communication and a mighty stream. He's also a sixth generation uh, Kansan, born and raised, and his non-academic interests include cooking, writing, poetry, and all things basketball. He's in a good state for that. Um, so we welcome Jacob to present his paper, U.S. Congress's Moral Sentiments Towards Farmers and Farming from 2012 to 2021. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, I probably sent in the wrong bio. Um, more apropos for this would have been that I also uh, worked in the, the a senator's office in 2019 out in DC, Senator Moran from Kansas. And uh, a lot of the impetus for the study comes from what I saw during my experience there. Um, and 
What I want to talk about today are just the brief contours of the paper. We'll deep dive into the methodologies um, in the next uh, talk. So I'm really interested here in how Congress talks about and frames um, through moral sentimentalism the problems of agriculture, or rather how they talk about uh, framing them in the farm bill. So this paper um, first looks at the problems of agriculture. Um, you probably know several of them due to COVID, right? When, the, when it first hit in March 2020, the supply chain just shut down and you had rotting food in fields, you had mass slaughtering of livestock. Um, concentration and consolidation is worse than ever. 83% of all market share is currently owned by four companies in the beef industry. Um, and when that happens, the effect of concentration is decreased resiliency. Um, so when you have diversity in, in farm scale and in what you grow, um, then you have truer resiliency or, or sustainability, these kind of catch-all terms that you're, you're hearing now in farming. Um, if you're asking yourself, why, why do I study farming in these C-SPAN video clips? What does that have to do with democracy? Um, I would tell you that agriculture is the thing at the core of our democracy. We often take it for granted, right? There's always food on the shelves. Um, while a lot of people do not have access to food, um, even in the United States, there's a plethora of it, right? So, so why is it so important? I would say that since 1890, the USDA's definition of farming has changed nine times. In 1974, um, which is the beginning of where some of these video clips emerge, which is happenstance or coincidence or maybe fate, whatever have you. Um, in 1974, the definition changed to $1,000 worth of agricultural products sold. Now that's changed from definitions of the past when you had 50% or more of the populace working directly in agriculture. Um, but at this time you have Earl Butts, who was the USDA, um, uh, he was the Secretary of Agriculture under Nixon. And he had this get bigger, get out motto for farmers, um, which I, I think you can say pretty assuredly paved the way for the uh, 1980s farming crisis. Um, so the point there is that if you don't have a stable food system, you do not have a good democratic foundation because as the money from agriculture in any civilization goes into industry, you have to make sure that it's consistent, it's safe so that all of these people who can um, be into the citizenry and, and really um, act out democracy have that ample time and space and sustenance. I mean, if you're hungry, you can't really do any of that. So that's the importance of farming. Um, in the, in the, the question I'm interested in, the main question is what has been US Congress's moral sentiment toward American farms and farmers? Now the moral sentiment piece of that is, is pretty clear and, I, and I'm glad we, I'm on this panel because there's a great deal of overlap. So uh, moral sentiment is studied a lot in psychosocial uh, research. Um, Jonathan Haidt was one of the first foundation, uh, first uh, people to really talk about moral foundations theory. Um, and it's, it's five different foundations um, that range from a, like a continuum, if you will. And the idea is that when you have uh, political parties, they don't really stand in for what people care about. Um, so when you talk about the sentiments that people display, um, you have to know not just the party that's under or, or maybe what, what funders they have, although that is key, but also what they care about the most. So for Democrats, it's been shown that care is a, a huge uh, moral function. That is that Democrats care about justice and fairness and helping the underserved, underprivileged uh, come up, whereas Republicans um, have shown to be more authoritative and also to show more loyalty and sanctity and uh, sanctity and degradation. So the American flag, when, when there were protests, I think in, in Portland a while back, and there was the ripping of the American flag, right? That was seen as such a degradation to a national symbol. So Republicans have been shown to um, genuflect to those more or use those more. Uh, now, the important point about moral foundations theory 
is that when Height and others develop this, it's not specific to the US. And I think this is an important point. It, it ranges across cultures. So the point here is not that it's within our context, but that can be multiple, multiple cultures and contexts, which is important, especially when talking about US agriculture, because our global reach has been um, unprecedented. I mean, ever since Washington, George Washington was the first to um, want farmers to tell like all of their data about their farms in order to establish their democracy and then also to establish our places at global hegemon the us has been interested in spreading our ideas ideologies across the um, not only the united states but globally um, for instance kansas state university has the only milling science program um, in the united states and since we were the first land grant in 1863 we also have the International Grains Program where, that I worked at that other um, people from other countries come in and we teach them how to grow monocropped conventional agriculture that degrades the soil and requires a plethora of pesticides and all that. So we really have global reach here. And so when we talk about moral foundations, it has to be uh, more of that scale to, of course, it, it, it'll, it'll will down here in my study. Okay, moving on. So. Gramscian cultural hegemony is a, a relevant theory. It's not the core one here, but the idea is that the ruling class, the power elite in Congress, if you will, um, injects the citizenry with beliefs, ideologies, attitudes, and in this case, morality, the idea that bigger is better. And it does so by shaping um, US farm policy through the farm bill, which occurs in every year ending in a two and a seven. So recently, 2012, 2017, and now uh, the debates are already sparking up about 2022. It, government's role in farming is um, wide reaching. So it, <laughs> when I was um, working, we, we would talk about in our meetings just how much farmers rely on US farm policy and especially direct payments and, and, and the direct payments, especially which increased um, but I think 4 billion just recently in direct farm payments for COVID. But things like insurance farming, right? Even if you wanna go sustainable regenerative routes, you can't because you're getting crop insurance to, to grow the commodities like soybeans, corn, instead of perhaps the more regenerative practices. So it really shapes um, uh, farming um, culture and effect. And, and that's why I kind of use this Gramscian lens, although I kind of leave it at that. Okay. So with that idea in mind, let's get back to the questions and to the hypotheses um, within moral sentimentalism. So um, my, my hypotheses that I'll pull up at the end, I just want to read through them. Uh, the first is democratic sentiment will be strongest within the care foundation when discussing issues of agriculture. Um, that gets back to the idea that Democrats have used care in almost every context before. Um, and then Republican sentiment will be the strongest within the authority foundation when describing issues of agriculture. Um, for the sentiment analysis, I'm not gonna dive deep into it. Uh, this gets to my second and my, my other two hypotheses, but sentiment analysis is used in several fields. It's consumer research, political science, um, finance, linguistics, social network analysis. It, there's machine learning techniques that have exploded due to it. Um, it's especially popular in analyzing Twitter data um, and big data. And um, it's, it's used to um, understand the underlying sentiment or, or emotion behind candidates as, as if that has a direct causal link, whether or not it does, we can talk about that later, but um, to their action, but the, the moral sentimental approach of US congressmen and women should direct how they act toward um, what sh provisions should be in the farm bill and, and other farming policies. Um, so if we can understand the sentiment, we can understand maybe perhaps why and how they act and, and do what they do. All right, so using this, uh, my, sec uh, my third hypothesis is that moral sentiment toward farms and farming has linear um, increase since 2012, and then that Congress's negative moral sentiment towards farm and farming has increased since 2012. So let's get into the methodology really quick. I'm going to go over this quickly because, again, like I said, we're going to get to it 
uh, next. So I searched the keywords farm and farming under clips and C-SPAN um, from the 1970 to 2021. Of course, this was in uh, June and July, so it's only half of this year. Um, we got 172 from the House, 106 videos from the Senate. Um, we excluded some based on criteria. So we were left with 132 and 89 respectively. Um, overall, there were 41 hours, uh, six minutes, um, 8,482 unique words, um, which, and then there were 307,000 total words, which excluded numbers, but not fragments. So this is really this big data approach to sentiment mining. Um, when, when we talk about the analyses, uh, I did two of them. So first it was a textual sentiment analysis, um, which I'll go over, and then a text search by coding for emergent issues, which also included polling um, exemplar quotations. So for sentiment analysis, um, it measures the polarity or tonality of text. Um, one of the uh, key articles I drew from, which it's hop at all. I don't know if you've heard of the extended moral foundations dictionary, uh, but it was a dictionary developed this year. Okay, someone shake their head. Yeah, so it was a dic dictionary developed this year um, to categorize all of the five um, moral foundations that I talked about previously um, and have these different dictionaries um, coded with words that best represent them. And so uh, I just want to go over uh, their quickly their methodology for doing this because I think it's, it's really brilliant. Um, I, I didn't do any of the hard work. They created the dictionary and I just kind of applied it here, which is great. Um, we talk about open science. This is one of the benefits, right? It, it's more accessible. Um, so first they sampled sentiment uh, sentences from their domains of interest. They crowd coded the sentiment strength of sentences. Then they estimated a sentence tonality score. While some others have used the word, uh, that's too reductionistic. And, and while others have used the paragraph and that's a feature, um, the way my data was assembled and it, sentence worked best for not being too reductionistic and also not being too broad, um, which worked well with, with the EFMD, uh, EMFD acronyms. Um, so the fourth is that they estimated a word tonality score. And then the, the final one is they discriminated between important and unimportant words. So the importance of this is that it not, doesn't just assign discrete categories, right? There's a, a composite score that ranges from negative one, which is most negative. So if you have care, care, harm, negative one would be complete harm, positive one would be complete uh, care. Um, and then they also assign a probability of how well the words closely aligned um, in their particular context with one with all of the five moral foundations. So it's not just that one word applies to one, it's that one has a probability that it falls within each of these five uh, in every case. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's important to you, but about, and then, so I, did, I coded this for Democrats, Republicans, and bipartisan, and about each one had a little over 2,000 uh, words per. So um, that's the number we're working with. The second one is text search for emergent issues. Um, so these, these qualitative tools that we use, there's so many of them, they're accessible, but at the end of the day, they're just that, they're tools. And so we have to, in my uh, uh, epistemological opinion, we have to also incorporate the more traditional methods of um, pulling quotations and then uh, hand coding. Um, now, because this is kind of the ancillary in second, and I didn't have a secondary coder, I would, I would look at these with a grain of salt. Okay, let's get on the findings, which you all came to see. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. All right. Can you all see that? I'm guessing you can. Okay, so this is um, the congressional sentiment toward farming bipartisanship um, over the years. I know I said 1970 to 2021, um, but this was what came up 
uh, this this year range was 2012 to 2021. Um, oh, sorry. Um, okay, so we look here and we see that Democrats use the most negative. So this is valence sentiment. Um, this isn't moral foundations yet, we'll get there. But I was just curious in the positive, um, negative, and then neutral sentiment um, that was expressed. So Democrats were by far the most negative. Um, for some reason, Republicans were the most positive. Um, that that was a shocker, to be honest with you. Although not really when you consider that most of these debates were in the context of the SNAP and WIC provisions, like anti-hunger measures within the Farm Bill, because that's the most morally valence. That's also why um, our methodology is, is best here to look at moral sentiment. Um, so it's, it's not actually that surprising. This shows the valence sentiment over time. Uh, the R squareds for this do, do increase. So uh, negative sentiment does increase over time. Um, positive kind of ebb and flows and then neutral remains mostly the same. But that's just, I mean, valence has a lot of limitations um, that I won't get into now. But so this, then we get to the extended moral foundations dictionary. So this was fascinating. All moral sentiments except for loyalty increased over time. Um, so... And then this is for both parties. Now we'll get to the breakdown later, but um, the 2016 spike was an outlier, only three videos. So you're gonna see spikes here, um, take them with more grains of salt. So they all increased over time, although well, slightly. Uh, and these are the vector scale scores. Um, these are the aggregated mean values. And then also, um, I should have mentioned this, it's, it's the score multiplied by the frequency of the word and then aggregated. Um, and then this is the vector scale of probability that they um, fall within. So it was clear that words fell within care and harm the most, which um, jives or gels with past research findings. Um, but then sanctity was the lowest, which also, um, corresponds with previous findings. So this is now the breakdown by party. Uh, these are the mean values. So Democrats use care the most, like we uh, figured. And then Republicans um, were not far behind on any of these. So keep in mind, these are very slight um, differences. Now it's not so slight when we get to the sentiment word scored by parties. And this is one of the key ones you should take a snapshot in your mind of, um, or on the screen computers. Um, so care was used most by Democrats, but it was the harm aspect. So you hear a lot of, oh, uh, either Republicans are harming uh, SNAP recipients, or there's there was a lot of talk about what do we give money to, insurance to, because there's all this debate about welfare queens and what they use their money for and how it comprised 80% of the provisions uh, of the spending in the farm bill. But then also you have, you know, just a handful of big commodity farmers receiving a ton of direct payments and how is that fair? So that was used quite a bit. Um, loyalty was used most by Republicans, even though it was the one that decreased. Not surprising, given um, the, the it's not the in-group loyalty within a party, it's, it's loyalty as expressed by the words toward the issues. So that's an important distinction. When we get on to my second um, mode here of uh, 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 text coding, I, I coded one to two core issues per um, transcript or clip. So farm bill, we should pass it was the most, um, debates about subsidies, second, uh, we should amend the farm bill was the third. And then um, this was a, not a core, per, but a periphery issue. I coded for anti-Republican and anti-Democrat sentiment. Anti-Republican came in at 33, anti-Democrat was one. So Democrats are very much um, fighting like cats and dogs with Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's get on to some of the quotations here. Uh, Joni Ernst, uh, said that I'm reminded of the 28-year-old lobster-eating Cadillac Escalade driving surfer from San Diego who had SNAP benefits and was abusing the system. Um, Senator Moran, who, whom I worked for um, in D.C., talked about it's a farm safety net. Um, we don't like to highlight that only a small portion of the farm bills related to farm programs, so that was often used as justification from Republicans to, to cut these um, programs. 
And then you have the challenging the Republicans' hypocrisy um, that they receive all of these sorts of benefits and are among the elite, and and yet they're making decisions for um, people and, and SNAP and, and WIC and all of the nutrition programs through the Farm Bill um, that could take away money. So that, I'll let you read that. Um, so the, oh, I just have to mention this. I'll probably end up taking it out. I don't know if it's important, but hemp was set 166 times. And so there were, and there was some support finally. And, and they, they had all these debates about whether smoking hemp would get you high and whether we should pass it. It was really funny. Um, but finally there came out with joint support, um, pun intended for, for hemp. Um, there was joint support for the joint support for the joint support to help with our arthritis, which I just thought was very funny. Um, Minnesota, Texas, California were the most frequent states. Makes sense. They're fifth, third, and first in total agriculture productivity. I then looked at agribusiness versus agricultural terms. I, my original idea was to create my own dictionaries. And then, you know, I got married and I had a honeymoon and I ran out of time and I didn't I wasn't yet able to validate a dictionary, which takes some time, but that would be a next step for sure. Um, just to see if the partisan, my hunch is that Republicans defer more to the um, less conservation, more technocratic um, conventional approaches, more direct payments to big farmers, right? So I just did a simple word search. Um, we can look over these later, um, but it's not the core. So here's the hypotheses, what we found. More, take these with more grains of salt. I want to run chi-square tests and then also a regression looking at the independent effects that um, partisanship has on moral foundations. So that's something I want to do before this actually goes out into publication um, just to test for statistical significance to more strongly look at these hypotheses. But those are the findings thus far. Um, some discussion points. So I'll, I'll stop sharing here. So you can just look at my pretty face once again. Um, so moral foundation has been criticized as simplistic. There's other um, approaches. There's the moral foundations by cooperation. So there's a morality as cooperation questionnaire with seven moral factors, um, future studies could compare it to the E, the one I used. Um, when we look at the ongoing neural revolution and also studies on cognitive bias within psychosocial research, we know that people, politicians included, use uh, emotion first, our subjective experience in the world based on morality to make a decision and we justify it with rationality. So I think sentiment and, and moral um, theories and, and research are ever more important, um, you know, rather than like Weber's bureaucracy or rationality theory. I think sociology should trend more in the sociology emotions direction. Um, but I think there's there's a paradox here. So two, two points of discussion and I'll wrap up here. The first is that, is there ever such a thing as a morality? Some scholars, doing this work have said, okay, these terms are amoral, these words or sentences or whatever the unit of analysis are amoral, these are moral. I chose not to dichotomize the two because my ontological position is that every one of these is decidedly moral, whether or not the probability is great that they fit within a moral foundation is another argument, but you can't have more amorality in the context of discussing anything really to a farm bill that's going to direct farm policy for five to 10 to 50 years down the road. Um, so that's why I chose not to pursue the amorality route, although other authors have. So that's a point of tension, discussion, whatever for the field. Um, the second one is that there's a paradox between, so, so when you express them, when let's say Senator Moran expresses a moral sentiment in 2012, right? He is anti-SNAP. As it goes on, you would expect that his, his, his um, in longitudinal studies, his moral at time T in 2012 will winnow future moral foundations. 
Now you could say that maybe something changes, a uh, change of heart, more money slid across the table in a different back room, and suddenly he's with it uh, politically. But is it that a morality at 2012 constrains or enables future care harm or whatever morality at, at four years later in 2016. That's a debate I think we need to have if implementing into uh, models and, and machine learning techniques over time. Like, um, is it that it, it, we have emergent properties or is it that we constrain through our models? And, and the paradox is that you have to constrain as academics in order to like study something because we can't study everything when we don't have enough time. Um, but how do you then account for emergence, i.e. more is different in those models? A practical implication uh, is that if you think that increased moral sentiment, sentimentalism over time is a bad thing, well, uh, as citizens, we can work to correct that in our own ad advocacy or emails, town halls, phone calls. We can reduce moral appeals. Or if we want to fight fire with fire, we can heighten our moral appeals. It's, that's more subjective. And, and we can talk about what you want to do with this findings if, if they hold. Um, there are limitations, of course, um, with me, with, with the work. But I'll just conclude by saying that I really, really thank the, the support from um, CCSE and, and this group. Um, I look forward to uh, talking about my paper and others. I think there's several connections here, but uh, farming is in, is in a dire strait right now in the United States. Less than 1% of people work in agriculture and there are a whole host of problems. And I think it starts at the top. It starts with Congress and it starts with our leaders acknowledging that Food systems are of the people, by the people, and for the people. And if they're just for the few at the top, then everyone under is going to be worse off in the long run in terms of their health. So thank you all and look forward to questions. Thank you, Jacob. That was a wonderful insight into our agricultural systems. I actually see Carly. I believe you had a question just to start us off. Wonderful. Yes, I always enjoy um seeing folks uh, use the C-SPAN video library for to study uh, floor speeches and congressional content. Um, my question, Jacob, I'm coming from a political science perspective. And um, when you talk, when you think about SNAP and you think about farmers, I think those are two very different concepts, both in terms of, of how politicians see them, but also how like, like, they're, they're owned by different parties, right? So public social programs, including SNAP, are owned by the Democrats, while you have the farmers are a community, right, that are a political base for the GOP. And so I'm wondering if these might be two different issues. Um, and so if you, if you apply moral sentimentalism, which I'm not familiar with, but I'm wondering if you got, might get some richer results if you separate, even though it's all under the realm of agriculture policy, you're still talking about social welfare and then you're talking about farming and farmers. And if you separate those two, you might see, you know, this, it, it, it look a little bit different. One way you might consider doing that, um, and I don't know if you've thought about this, but maybe look at mentions in the C-SPAN video library. You can do keyword search instead of clip search. Um, I, I don't know if you've considered that, and then you would pick up all mentions of, of farmers or farming, and then you could look specifically maybe a SNAP, right? Because even though it's not within the framework of discussions on the farm bill, you would still be getting the broader picture of those, um, those sentiments. What are your thoughts on that? I think that's a good idea, and I have considered it before. I think what I ran into, and this is not to justify my approach as um, better, but it's to say that my unit of analysis in this case was just to text search farms and farming and then find those clips and everything related to agriculture within it. Um, my worry about just doing SNAP is that you're then going to have other discussions outside of the agricultural context on these issues. And that's not the core of what I wanted to study. So although I did emphasize SNAP and WIC a lot throughout this talk, it was still the fifth emergent issue. Um, so it wasn't everything that I talked about, right? But it, it did come up 29 times. So 
then I, I, if we take that approach, I then have to say, okay, well, is, is hemp separate is, um, you know, cause they, then they talk about a wide, like the farm bill is such an omnibus bill that it covers everything from trade to animal rights, to even poverty. They talk about urban aid. Like I didn't know, and this is a slippery slope fallacy if you want to go there, but when do I parse out one of these issues or another? This is a good approach for, for future directions. Although in this study, I just decided to keep it within the realm of agriculture because it's, it's not the only issue. Um, but, but this also brings up a limitation, right, of the dictionary and other uh, approaches uh, using, using EMFD is that it's at the sentence level and it's looking at different moral foundations and the probability that they find within them, but it, it just takes all of this rich data as a bag of words. So you're just taking all these words, you're throwing them into the air, and then you're picking and grabbing analysis from them, but they're no longer context dependent, right? So we're, that's why I really said that these this, this dictionary is just a tool. And, and that's why I'm really trying to emphasize the qualitative aspect as well. What I think I, what, you, what I do need to do for the next iteration of this is put more emphasis on other of the core issues and less emphasis on the snap so that it doesn't come across that I'm making this bias. So um, yes, yes and. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. That was a great introduction to um, the things that we can find in the C-SPAN archives about agriculture and all the overlapping topics. Um, so just in keeping an eye on our time here, I'm going to welcome our final paper. Um, this is brought to us by Stephanie Weidman and Lori, Laura Merrifield Wilson. Stephanie Weidman holds a PhD in communication studies with an emphasis in rhetoric from Wayne State University in Detroit. She received her master's degree in political science with an emphasis in public administration and her BA in communication with an emphasis in public relations from the University of West Florida. She currently resides in Indianapolis, Indiana as an assistant professor and director of the forensic speech and debate team at the University of Annapolis. And Laura is an associate professor of political science at the University of Annapolis, where she also serves as the pre-law advisor and co-director of the Gender Center. Her specifications include gender politics, campaigns and elections, and state government. In addition to these academic specialties, she has a passion for social justice issues, civic engagement, and service learning. Um, she also earned her bachelor's in theater, a master's in political science, and a master's in women's studies, a master's in public administration, and a PhD in American politics from the University of Alabama. That is an impressive resume. So we welcome both Stephanie and Laura, and we look forward to their paper, Visualizing the Incitement of Insurrection, a Content Analysis of Visual Symbols Used in Donald J. Trump's Second Impeachment Trial. Good morning, everyone. I should start off by saying I just really liked school. Um, and also that Stephanie is the other co-director of the Gender Center. So she didn't mention that in her bio, but um, we had the opportunity to work together for a couple projects and we're really excited to present one of those to you today. Uh, so we'll be talking about visualizing the incitement of insurrection, a content analysis of visual symbols used in Donald J. Trump's second impeachment trial. And before I go further, I just wanna give a shout out and thank you to the Center for C-SPAN Engagement and Scholarship Video Library to the Brian Lamb School of Communication and to Andrea Langris specifically for your help and support in this project. When Whitney, Stephanie and I were talking about uh, the impeachment in particular and, um, and, and what we were seeing from it, I am a political scientist by scholarship by nature. Whitney Tipton, who's not presenting here today, but was critical in the analysis and really led our methodology, uh, is a full-time communication. And Stephanie's really both. She has the experience in both, both disciplines, but we were looking at the impeachment and trying to understand the use of the visual symbols because we noticed from the political science side, from the communication side, that they were really trying to use these symbols to enhance the arguments that they were presenting. And it was very much like bringing in a PowerPoint and saying, no, no, I can tell you that there was this insurrection. I can tell you what's going on, but it's so much more powerful if I show you the clips from Twitter, if I show you the live news feed, if I could show you a map of where people were. And so that is a large part of why we wanted to study this because we felt that um, with the rich resources of the C-SPAN video library and to be able to understand going back through, and it was only a couple months ago, it's hard to imagine, I know, but going back through both the insurrection and the impeachment trial, understanding the use of visual images 
really gives us a better sense of what they do, what social media does, um, the role of the presidency and rhetoric more generally in the 21st century. So what we'll be doing today, um, we'll start, of course, with discussion of insurrection and impeachment. I will toss it over to Stephanie for that. We'll talk about the rhetorical presidency, Caesar Tullus et al., um, what they analyzed in the 80s, what they saw, um, maybe their worst nightmares realized. We'll discuss that. Visual rhetoric. We're going to talk a lot about the methodology and analysis. This was a really exciting part of the research because of understanding how we were going to look at 800 plus images that were used and um, how they were used, why they were used. We apply Schrill's analysis to that in terms of um, their application. And then finally, the implications. So going back to Tullis, uh, questions about the role of rhetoric, the role of visual analysis and and how it tells us what our uh, it, how it explains what our presidency stands for now, how it, it addresses unique presidential rhetoric of 2021 and, of course, beyond. So with that said, I'm going to toss it over to Stephanie and uh, she will continue on. Thank you so much, Laura, and thank you again, everybody, for the support and for being here today. So we want to take you back to the beginning of this experience for us that we all have this communal experience of uh, watching what happened on January 6, 2021. I'm going to show you short clips that come from um, the opening lengthy video that the House impeachment managers uh, per, uh, started their case with. We will stop the steal. Today, I will lay out just some of the evidence proving that we won this election and we won it by a landslide. This was not a close election. And after this, we're going to walk down and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. Okay, so you can see here, this was um, video content from Trump's rally that he held uh, earlier on in the day on January 6th. Oh, pardon me. And then here's a compilation of video that they used to present what happened when the protesters got in the building. My challenge today is not about the good people of Arizona. And it will stand in recess until the call of the chair. We'll pause. Protesters are in the building. Thank you. So I think uh, we wanted to bring you guys back to that moment through watching these clips as they produced them in the compilation for the house managers because what that brought forth in us in our communal civic experience with this was a lot of emotion, which really guided us toward the theories that we wanted to use to explore these images. So quickly going through the concept of the rhetorical pre presidency, we find that it was a nice linkage between political science and communication, both utilize the rhetorical presidency, sometimes coming to different conclusions about its efficacy um, and ethicality, really. So Tulis 1987 said basically the power of the president lies in their ability to directly communicate to the public through what they call the bully pulpit. This was a 20th century phenomenon, which really started with uh, Wilson's administration being the first administration to utilize mass electronic media to communicate directly with the populace. Um, and it continues to be shaped by our technological advances in media. 
However, it's important to know that Tullis was wary of the type of rhetorical power it afforded the president, thinking that there might be a way to for that rhetorical power to corrode our politics. And then Stuckey in 2010 said that perhaps it's really time for us to stop and take a re-examination of the assumptions of the rhetorical presidency, because most of what how we've understood it, both in policy and communication, has been under the guise of a white male president who governs within a pre-cable and internet context. So there's a bit from the rhetorical presidency and going back into the emotion that that elicited from us as citizens or you know viewers of this occasion that led toward visual rhetoric because it is a strong pathway to be able to engage with emotion and political decision making. So from the theories, basically we took a very abstract uh, concept of the image. So this can be either still or it can be video as you see. Both of those were utilized throughout um, the impeach second impeachment procedure proceedings, which also takes us back to Aristotle, just a brief remembering that um, rhetorical proofs, ethos, logos, and pathos all have to uh, go into uh, any attempts at persuasion. Although if you're looking through the literature, we see there was a degradation of the input, like of pathos over time in the past, you know, 100 years, I guess you would say, but at least in the past like 20 years, through theories like visual rhetoric, we've come to accept that pathos, emotion, really isn't inherently good or bad. Maybe it just is, and it's something we can't escape in politics, and we need to contend with that um, a political sentiment, if you will, to borrow from our last person. So uh, visuals at their basic are able to access pathos because of the way that visuals invite audience to interact with it. It's almost like an enthymeme, enthymematic argument where you may have a minor premise, a major premise, and a conclusion. And what the rhetor does is they say something without saying it by suppressing one of the three. Visuals, as Smith argues in 2007, uh, the power of them is that meaning is created within that interaction. Harriman and Lucchetti's in 2002 say something I think it's really interesting about how visuals and images in our polity allow us to have sort of a civic imagination. When he says, when the event shown is itself a part of national life, the public seems to see itself and to see itself in terms of a particular conception of civic identity. Following from Harriman and Lucchetti's words, it's in, you know, prudent for us to think about how this shaped, this viewing, this image um, event, how it shaped the way we not only understand the events of January 6th, but any potential at catharsis or healing as we move forward. So one of the things we found that um, connected rhetorical presidency and images is Schill's political image typology. He did a large survey. He came up with these 10 important functions on images and politics. So you have a visual argument that through explanation and talk with us, we decided we would understand to be an argument that is inherently visual, couldn't be the same without the visual. A dramatizing function, candidate image function, documentation function, transportation function, meaning you can transport the audience to another time, agenda setting function, emotional function, identification function, symbols function, and an ambiguity function. This brought us to oppose three research questions to direct the study that we we're going to do. The first is into which categories of visual communication do visual aids using the impeachment proceedings fall? Second, what additional categories of visual political communication are present in the impeachment proceedings? And third, to what degree do visuals align with the verbal arguments used in impeachment proceedings? So our methodology, as Laura said, um, once she graciously went and watched every minute of the second impeachment and documented every single time an image was up, uh, came out with an original sample of 805 video clips from the C-SPAN archives. And we were like, whoa, okay, we can't quite see that one coming, but we found a way to work with it. So we took detailed notes among each other as we were viewing this to bolster our um, arguments. But from that, what uh, Whitney created was a code book that com was comprised of demographic data, as well as Shill's 10 functions. We could code for all of that. She created a Qualtrics survey that we did, utilized to submit information while we were coding. And then for intercoder reliability, she chose a randomized 10% for all of us to code the same images. And our result out of that was 79.8. To strengthen, we conversed over codes and went back to our original notes. And then we were able to get our intercoder reliability up to 92.4, which Narjana and CV 2017 say a percentage agreement greater than 80% is acceptable, greater than 90% is strong. So we felt like we were in a pretty good place. Then we got some, out some of the redundant data and our final sample size was 706 clips. Mind you, we also 
did this over the summer together with no grad students and gained a much greater appreciation for all the work they do. So here's our data analysis as it breaks down on the number of visual aids used. You have several speakers from the House impeachment which is the first eight you can see on the left, and then the final two. What I think is interesting, even though you have way more speakers on the House impeachment manager side, you still see a strong element of a visual presence. I mean, in fact, watching these impeachment proceedings, at times it seemed like it was almost a war of the visuals. Going into it, they, I would imagine the defense lawyers knew that they were coming up against a lot of documentation in here, and they tried to construct visuals that could contend with that documentation. So our RQ1 was answered with this, the frequency of the, I'm sorry, excuse me, of Schill's um, 10 typologies. Uh, so when we applied those, what we noticed were the top two were to make visual arguments, meaning that the visual was the most important part of the argument. Second was to document effects, but in a, not an unreasonably close or far distant third was to dramatize policy. So coming out of that RQ, we started to formulate a way of understanding how these visual arguments, dramatization and documentation work together. Then on RQ2, we identified what we call two potential new functions that we saw throughout here. So the one we're calling it right now is a preemption function. There was a lot on both sides, but this is a quick sample of one side trying to use the other side's words against them. So let's watch this here, impeachment management. Something. Kellyanne Conway, the president's close advisor, called to quote, add her name to the chorus of aides urging Donald Trump to take action. Ivanka Trump, the president's own daughter, went to the Oval Office as soon as the rioting escalated. And was as confirmed by Senator Graham, quote, trying to get Trump to speak out, to tell everyone to leave, end quote. Minority leader Kevin McCarthy called Jared Kushner, pleading with him to persuade Trump to issue a statement or to do something. And Kushner too went down to the White House after that call. And it wasn't just the people at the White House. Members of Congress from both parties who were trapped here were calling the White House to ask for help. Some members even appealed directly to Donald Trump. These members who had, quote, been loyal Trump supporters and were even willing to vote against the electoral college results were now scared for their lives. Minority leader Kevin McCarthy repeatedly even got into a screaming match as the attack was underway, demanding that Trump do something, issue a statement denouncing the mob. I imagine many of you sitting here today. Okay, uh, notably about that, you see them kind of picking a who's who from Trump's orbit, the Republican orbit, uh, to preempt potential attacks that could be coming up. Do something. The second, excuse me. Kellyanne. The second one that we did, we're calling kind of a sub function, but it's a compilation function. We started to see uh, or understand that between the two sides, it seemed like it was a quality versus quantity. So a lot of the visuals and the images and video that was used from the house impeachment managers section seemed to be very in depth. I mean, obviously they had more access uh, to the documentation of what happened on January 6th, or at least from you know, people who are favorable for that. The opposing side, the defense lawyers, seem to just go for just sheer numbers and visuals. And you're going to get this idea because when you look at it um, about how they were fighting over the legal definition of fighting terms, which is a very nebulous part of uh, legal terms related to First Amendment studies, right? And so, you know, obviously one side uh, seems to be using emotion as these, they were fighting words that Trump used, and therefore he is, you know, guilty of this. He created um, basically what happened on January 6th. From the defense lawyers, you got something like this. Who has led us in this fight is to fight for this. This fight. And every day I'm in the United States Senate, I will fight. And one of the things we do is fight, should fight. Um, because my constituents send me here each and every day to fight. We have been fighting this fight and we need to be side by side so we can succeed. And so I hope that you will all join us in our fight. And if we fight, and as the next governor of Georgia, I will never stop fighting. We can show the old guard something new and we can fight. 
Yeah. Okay. So that wasn't the most fun portion to code because it was to say the least redundant. This went on for like 10 minutes from the defense lawyers and then came back and saw the same clips of Dems using the actual root fight again. Um, so it seemed to be a large part of the visual verbal strategy, if you will. Who has led us in this now I'm going to keep going on here. We answered the first two rhetorical questions by um, showing you the data about the numbers and in which areas they fall, presented potentially um, some new functions that could be added to Shill's typology. The third RQ seemed to be no, because when we did find incongruity between the visual and verbal argument, it seemed to be explained more by like slides being used incorrectly. Um, but we saw some significant rich information by um, answering RQ1 and RQ2, which led us to implications. And I'm briefly just going to touch on the rhetorical implications. So it does further substantiate the need for a better understanding of emotion and political decision making. And our words, our study can feed to that movement as we try to understand uh, the populist constituents better. Pathos seems to be key. And for future research, what I was looking at is those top three uses of uh, the visual argument, documentation function, and the dramatization function, um, I'm interested in uh, trying to understand how one of those might motivate the other. I mean, perhaps like a Burkean analysis, something like that, um, to investigate more of how those three interact together. But we're going to go back and I'm going to turn it back over to Laura here to talk about in general the implications for the rhetorical presidency and tackling that big question that Tullis posed to us back in the 1980s here in 2021. Laura? Thanks, Stephanie. As you can see, in just the few clips we showed you, we mentioned there were over 800. It, these were really important um, using pieces of social media, using pieces of, of actual media, any type of visual and sometimes audio um, connections to make this argument about the way that the presidency, the whole idea of the implications of the second impeachment where the president directly incited this, the president was directly responsible. And so it really flips on its head this argument of Tullis who talked about, he was a, a little concerned, was this a warning, you know, the, the corrosive aspect of um, being able to reach out to individuals. But in particular, we consider this, it is you know, the corrosion of politics. It's also the ability for a person to truly go public. For the president, he was able to reach out to his supporters and his followers. He didn't need traditional media. He didn't need um, the party's support. And you can see in various clips, and certainly if you paid attention in February to the second impeachment hearings, uh, there wasn't always the party support he was able to go public in a whole new level. And it makes me think that Tullis right now, who actually does have a Twitter account, but back in the 1980s, as they said, this being able to reach out to the public, it can be wonderful for president. It can, it can provide a new opportunity, a new experience, and it can also be really problematic and really harmful. And part of what we saw through this impeachment trial and looking at the use of visual symbols was for the impeachment managers trying to make the argument and the connection. Of course, this was rebuffed by the defense, but whether or not the president was able to effectively go public, as one would say, uh, to connect with his supporters in order to incite an insurrection. One will come to their own conclusions, but I'll say that's one of the most exciting parts of this research was assessing the way that they were able to use these visual symbols to rely on these in the impeachment to make their arguments, either as the House impeachment manager saying, yes, the president did do that, or as the defense saying, no, in fact, the president did not. But I, with that, I will conclude it here and, um, and open up for any questions. We are very excited about this research, and I know we have limited time, but would love to answer anything that you might have for us. So thank you. Thank you, Laura and Stephanie. That was really fascinating work, especially set with something that's so recent. It's great to see the archives be used uh, for these really contemporary examples. Um, I'm going to ask if there's any questions from the audience. I, I do have one to start us off if, uh, if anyone else has one. Yeah, Carly, go for it. I have a question about this larger normative implication. Do you think that this is a one-off presidency in terms of the use of going public, right? And so, or do you think 
this is something that we should expect down the road. Are we going to see more impeachments? Are we going to be, you know, that are using these sorts of methods, using the president's own words and how he or she goes public? Is this a new era of the presidency um, that we should expect to come? Laura, go ahead and handle that one from Polly Sai. I'm muted. Sorry. I was chomping at the bit for it. So Carly, that's a really good question. I wouldn't ever want to prognosticate in terms of future impeachments. I'm personally hoping a no for that, but I would say Obama was the first social media president. Uh, Trump used it to another level. We don't see Biden using it quite in the same way, but to me, it seems that this is a, it's a microphone and it's a direct access, a platform that some presidents, depending on their type of leadership style, and this actually goes to that first paper, uh, you talk about the short, quick impact versus like winning the larger argument, depending how that person communicates and connects with their supporters, this medium is not going to go away. Right? And depending on how the person wants to make those connections, I think it's certainly an opportunity. Now, so far, what we've seen in the Biden administration is President Biden doesn't use it, use social media in the same way that President Trump did, um, and, and nor in the same way that President Obama did. But isn't because the medium, the platform isn't going away, I think that it will always provide an opportunity for presidents to reach out. And it, it's much more about their own personal types of leadership, whether or not they they use it in that sort of way. 